the Amazon. In a few decades, all that's left might be some shrubbery and the megacorp that stole its name, but for now, the Amazon basin represents more than half the world's rainforest, with one in ten species anywhere on Earth living in its domain. Most focus usually goes to the life among the trees, which makes sense as there are some iconic creatures, howler monkeys, macaws, toucans, jaguars, tree frogs, and Jeremy. But I find it strange not much attention is given to the actual Amazon River itself. Sure, you probably know of the piranhas, but what else? Truth is, life in the river is just as strange and magnificent as anywhere else in the Amazon. Do you want to see the wonders of... Whatever, you know the drill. Mind you, the river itself does not have the same conditions everywhere. The Amazon is made up of many tributaries, which can have vastly different source locations across South America, and thus affect the sediment and nutrient loads of their waters. To further explain this, we have to look at the three major freshwater rivers in the Amazon, Whitewater, Blackwater, and Clearwater. Whitewater rivers drain from the Andes Mountains, and clay minerals from the Andes get transported downstream. These minerals are nutrient-filled and rejuvenate the soils of whitewater rivers, and therefore they are the most nutrient-rich of the freshwater bodies in the Amazon. They get their name from all of these suspended sediments and matter in the waters, which leave them a coffee and cream shade of brown, which is, might I add, not white. Blackwater rivers begin in ancient rock formations north and south of the rainforest, which lack nutrient-giving clay minerals. They are instead inundated with decaying organic matter from the forests around them, which turn the river the same color as black tea, which once more are both not black. Blackwater rivers are generally very poor in nutrients and also quite acidic, making them the subway sandwiches of rivers. Clearwater rivers come from the same ancient rock formations Blackwater does, but usually progresses through rocky terrain, which means their water stays relatively transparent with a greenish tinge. Now, life in the Amazon is not just dependent on the type of river it finds itself in, but also on how much these rivers change annually. The Amazon River experiences some crazy levels of rain, more than a meter and a half at the minimum. This, combined with yearly snowmelt from the Andes, means that flooding in the basin drastically changes the terrain. The intense fluctuation of water that happens every year is called the flood pulse and affects every member of the river. For instance, look at the ecosystem of the white waters. White waters are surrounded by what is called Varzia, vast floodplains home to a thousand species of tree. When the white water rivers overflow, they submerge the plants around their banks, allowing the animals of the rivers to feast in shallow feeding grounds. One of the flood pulse's most rotund beneficiaries is the Amazonian manatee. Smaller than your average manatee, this freshwater variant gorges itself on the flooded flora, as well as free-floating aquatic plants, which gather in incredible clumps known as floating meadows. Flooding also impacts the reproductive cycles of river dwellers with fish migrating many, many kilometers to find ideal spawning habitats. This extends to the larger members of the river as well. The manatee female will give birth to calves and produce milk during the flood pulse when her food consumption is at its zenith, and she can afford, food-wise, to raise offspring. Caimans adapt to the flood pulse as well. Ah, the caiman, the Garfunkel of the crocodilians, often overshadowed by its famous cousins, the crocs and gators. This surprises me, as it is one of the most abundant top predators of the most biodiverse region on Earth, eating scores of freshwater fish. But for how cool caimans are, they are even cooler parents. Cayman mothers will build giant nests for their eggs, and when they hatch, transport them in their mouths to shallow pools. Did your mom ever give you a ride in her mouth? The eggs have to hatch during the flood pulse, as the increased water levels creates shallow nurseries for the baby caimans, which will learn how to hunt as their mother watches over them for several months. This dependence on plants and flooding also extends to black and clear water rivers and to animals you wouldn't think to depend on trees. There are some 2,500 fish species in the Amazon basin, and there are projected to be many yet undescribed, bringing the total somewhere closer to 3,000 or even 5,000 species of freshwater fish in the basin. Compare this to the 360 freshwater fish species in all of Europe, or the approximately 1,000 in North America. Amazon fish diversity just cannot be compared, but for their overwhelming diversity, in their habitat there are very few resources freshwater fish usually consume. 
In shaded nutrient deficient black water rivers, producers like aquatic plants, algae, and plankton are in low supply. Instead, fish species depend on the flooding of igapos, the swamp forest surrounding the water. The fish population in igapos springs up significantly during the flooding season, as nutritious plants and even fruit are eaten up. The tambaki, a hefty relative of the piranha, shows how successful vegan fish can become. The creature feeds primarily on seeds and fruits and grows to a weight of 44 kilos, one of the largest fish in the Amazon. Other fish diets are more indirectly tied to trees. Look at the leaf litter habitats that line the banks of Blackwater rivers. As endless trees line the sides of these rivers, their edges are choked with fallen leaves. The detritus is at first decomposed by fungi, which are themselves eaten by invertebrates. The fish species that prey on these bugs each lay claim to certain regions of the litter, specializing in areas with differing oxygen levels, depth, and particle size. All of the fish are themselves life-sustaining for predators like the Amazon kingfisher, who feed on the fish when they come out of the litter into the clear open water. Therefore, this supposedly dead water is a rich ecosystem in its own right. I hereby take back all those things I said about black water a couple minutes ago. Subway has nothing on them. Fish also have to adapt to the fluctuating levels of the rivers, and not just when it's all sunshine and rainfall. When the flood pulse ends, the water recedes once more, and the abundant opportunities for food are lost. The fish now enter a period of sluggish activity, where food is rarely consumed and they reserve all the energy they can. As well, the very terrain change can affect the lives of animals greatly. Sometimes for the positive, the arau, or giant Amazon river turtle, lives up to its name, attaining weights of 60 kilograms and a shell that can grow almost a meter long. When the water level drops, sandy beaches reveal themselves, where the arau gather in numbers. They will lay their eggs here and ward off the presence of predators while they bask in the sun. But for most, the changing landscape is not advantageous. At the apex of the flood pulse, all the bodies of water in the floodplain are connected together, allowing aquatic animals to travel freely. But once the water recedes, many small bodies of water can become isolated from the rest of the river. These are called oxbow lakes, water severed from the active flow of rivers, and whose oxygen is slowly sucked up by aquatic plants, leaving a deoxygenated stagnant pool of water, hard for your standard freshwater fish to survive in. Of course, we're talking about Amazon river fish, who of course have adaptations for this kind of habitat. This includes the very largest of the Amazonian fish, the magnificent arapaima. Its gills are small and feeble, but it doesn't need them. The arapaima is a fish that breathes air. You heard that right. A modified swim bladder attached to its mouth acts as a lung, allowing it to gulp down air at the surface. Because of this, the arapaima can remain active in the oxbow lakes and feeds on the gill-breathing fish who are forced to slow down. This adaptation has led them to become gargantuan. Arapaima can grow up to 200 kilograms in weight and three meters in length, the largest species of fish in the Amazon and one of the largest freshwater fish in the world. Their size makes them the top predators of the oxbow lakes where their pouty-faced rule reigns supreme. Arapaimas aren't the only mighty predators of the Amazon, however. The abundance of fish in the river means there will be many animals who are ready to set down to a fish dinner day in and day out. Take for instance, otters. Whoa, 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 you say. Otters in the Amazon? That's preposterous. And you'd be right, I lied to you, because I'm actually talking about the giant otter. Giant otters can reach the height of a man in length and weigh some 30 or so kilograms. Primarily land creatures, they slump into creeks and oxbow lakes looking for fish. When not looking for food, they spend their time doing otter things, which have been brilliantly illustrated in this research paper about them. Just look at them. Oh, aww. Uh, giant otters don't just live a life of cuddles, however. There are threats in the river. Caimans appeared to leave them alone, but it's speculated the big cats of the jungle will hunt otters. Even their own prey can be a handful. One of the giant otter's menu items is piranhas, which unsurprisingly can be problematic, as some otters carry visible scars from piranha bites on their sides. Speaking of piranhas, Amazon river fish really provide a great starting point for the aquariums of any Bond villains out there. Piranhas are obviously in the pop culture hall of fame, but there is another resident as well that any evil mastermind appreciates. And no, I'm not talking about the catfish that supposedly swim up your dinghy. I'm referencing the bizarre electric eel. 
Firstly, they aren't even technically eels. They're actually in a family of animals known as knife fish. I guess electric knife fish doesn't roll off the tongue as well, but I would advocate it's actually even cooler. Anyways, the actual mechanism behind the electric powers is fascinating and can't be all described here. But basically, the eels possesses numerous battery-like cells called electrocytes. Along with specialized muscles, the eel can discharge an electric shock from these cells. Their electricity can be used for navigating murky water, locating prey, and communicating. But of course, as an incredible shock to stun fish and quickly gulp them as their victim's muscles are recovering. The eel is a master of manipulating its shock as well. For more stubborn prey, the eel can curl around the animal, essentially making one complete circuit, before delivering continuous jolts of electricity that eventually weaken the encircled creature. But the animal's greatest shock comes when defending itself. The eel's electrical discharge is actually dampened in the water and can do the most damage when in direct contact with another animal. For this reason, if harassed, the electric eel is known to literally hop out of the water, giving the predator a little love tap with its chin before frying it to oblivion. And yes, they can be lethal to humans, so don't go around kicking electric eels if that was your plan for the night. And to round out the list of Amazon predators, we have maybe the most mysterious and iconic of the river's large aquatic residents, the pink river dolphin, or the boto. But did you know there's actually two types of river dolphin, the other, more obscure species called the Tukushi. The Tukushi looks more like your standard marine dolphin, albeit with a pink underbelly, while the Boto looks like, well, you know. Besides appearance, the dolphins do differ or coincide in other ways. Both are found in the varying tributaries of the Amazon, hunting a diverse assortment of fish species. Both species are also social animals, although Tukushis usually travel in pods of eight or so animals, while Botos travel in smaller couples. The Tukushi is smaller and more agile, able to flip and turn in the air, and hunts by chasing fish down near the water's surface. Meanwhile, the Boto is the largest of any freshwater dolphin, reaching 185 kilos and 2.5 meters in length, and instead relies on a specialized sonar system to detect prey in the murky depths. Clearly, the debate of who's the better Amazonian river dolphin can rage on forever, but I think the fact that the Amazon River is home to not one, but two dolphin species is what's to be appreciated here. The Amazon River is arguably the most incredible freshwater ecosystem on Earth. Let's remember that fish diversity again. It has at least three times more freshwater fish species than all of North America. And the river isn't just important for the fish. For as much as the forest provides food for the river animals, the river is a necessity for so many forest creatures as well. I could go on, but I'll just let some of it speak for itself. Nowhere else on Earth will you find a place as rich in life, in biodiversity, than here, the unmatchable, magnificent Amazon. Thanks for watching. This awesome music for once has not just been taken by me, it's been made specifically by Dara Hughes for this video, and I cannot thank them enough for it. Thanks to all the images and videos I used to make this. Thank you for watching, and until next time, see ya!